$21 million to spend a day, right? You have yeah. to figure out how you get that money and how you start slower. You know, I, th I think that um, publishers, when I think of what, what is a publisher, a publisher does three things for you and kind of always has in the video game business. They distribute your game for you, they provide you um, capital that enables you to pay people to actually build the game, and they give you a bunch of shitty advice. <laughs> usually, right? And they differentiate themselves from one another by, the, by how convincing they are at giving you shitty advice. Money is money, so you kind of can measure that pretty easily. Um, and then distribution. And, and now, when retail distribution kind of is no longer particularly relevant, uh, you don't have to have a logistic, lo lo logistics infrastructure to distribute games. Um, when you talk to kind of mobile publishers, they'll, they'll say, well, we don't really want to give you any money. Um, we have great relationships with Apple. Okay, you know, fair enough. Um, and we can execute your marketing spend. Um, I, I think that when you're kind of going into this process of deciding do I want to work with a publisher or not, you need to um, avoid getting caught up in the value of their advice. It may be great advice, but it's hard to really measure that prior to um, signing a deal, and, and it's hard to kind of weigh that in, in, in the agreement that you, that you um, structure. Uh, again, money is money, and they will put money into your – this is very measurable. I know that you know, if, if I have a critical mass of uh, users and I um, can measure the, the value of those users to a reasonable degree of ac accuracy, it's a pretty straightforward exercise. Um, if I have capital to extract more capital from what I put in, right? Um, and, and, then, and then there's the distribution thing, which is really just cross-promotion, because I haven't really ever met anyone who's willing to guarantee you featuring by Apple, because they can't, they, right? They, they can't. A lot of times they won't even guarantee you installs, they'll just guarantee you impressions, yeah. which is a soft opportunity cost out of their own inventory. And they can terminate the agreement at any time, which means they'll overpromise their inventory, and then when they see one take traction, they'll cut the other nine yeah. agreements. Sorry, Charlie. Right. But it is, it is in terms of what, what is an effective strategy we've seen in mobile and in you know, what was social games, is that if they do have a large catalog and they do have a large, you know, uh, a large number of users going to a game and they can cross-promote within that game or on some kind of channel, that is a nice place to, you know, so that you can get you know, more unique impressions. It is, but there's a very limited number of companies, in my experience, that are willing to use inventory um, that they own 100% to push a low margin business when they could be pushing a high margin business. And what that means is, I have first party, you made a great Flappy Bird game. Let's just say Flappy Bird. You made a great Flappy Bird game. Well, I could spend maybe three months and a million bucks and make a pretty great Flappy Bird game. And instead of giving up you know, half of my margin to you on it, why not just do it myself? And that's kind of the Zynga problem. Why did yeah. Zynga never really become a publisher on Facebook? But it, it, was, it was hard for them to justify giving up margin to third party developers. Um, I don't know that that was the right decision for them in the long term. Mm -hmm. And I do think as a developer, you need to be able to kind of convincingly say to a publisher who has inventory like that, like a Storm 8 or someone like that, like, I can build this game and you just can't do it. You don't have the capability to make a game as awesome as this one, and here's why. I've got incredible designers like Scott, I've got incredible technologists, or whatever it is, right? I have a, I have a capacity that, that you don't have. Um, so you're not giving up a business that you could build yourself. You're, this is completely incremental. And anytime so, you're talking to a partner, that's the thing. It's like, what is my value? And there are lots of ways to uh, think, but one of the important things about valuing your company is if you can get if you can just basically delay taking other people's money for as long as possible and get as much traction, so, so much uh, uh, as much visible interest in your game as you can uh, before you know you ask for that conversation, then that's that's good. So that might be you know your da your daily active users. It might be the number of installs. It might be the number of you know lots of different factors. And so we can just wait that long. Uh, that, that's good. Well, I, 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 there's an interesting point. Um, our the third party the third part of the Game fund of uh, being a comment at, uh, and then I'll throw this question back at, at, uh, at one of our demo at the events when somebody got up on stage and said, Well, we only take products that are soft launched and are doing really well. To which he said, Then why do we need you? At that point, uh, is there still 
is it just history repeating itself? Is it that publishers who call themselves publishers want it all their own way, and that they want a sort of zero risk proposition? And that, and then, and, and actually, what's interesting to your point, Dan, is it that the, the third party publishers, will, third party developers, will never get it as good of a shake of the stick as if we were internal, old, as, as it was with old console. You know, that, that's absolutely true, but I mean, it's a, it's a, you have to know that if you've got a game that's soft launch and you know what the numbers are, they're all, go, they're all gonna ask you for that because everyone wants an investment opportunity where it's like, it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah like it's extraordinarily good, like, low risk, right? Um, of course, I would like that too. I would like to be able to know that I can turn this dollar into two dollars with, you know, a, minimum a high effort. degree yeah. of predictability. <laughs> um, but, but if you have that game that's in that position, go into that conversation knowing it, but also go into the conversation knowing that um, you need to exceed the margins that they get from that internal game, right? So, you know, if, 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 they're, gonna, if they're gonna have a yield of 150% on an internal game and you're giving up, you know, half of the net revenue, I'm gonna get lost in this math, but you're gonna need to deliver a 200% yield if that makes sense, right? And you, and you need to go into the conversation realizing that. And if, and, and if you can achieve that, then you need to look at them the same way you look at a, somebody giving you a mortgage. They're really just it's cash flow, yeah. right? So uh, one of the things that, 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 that we've noticed in our portfolio, maybe even made a conscious decision, is that we're very mobile folks. We have some PC games as well. But is there, everybody, is talking about mobile, mobile or mobile social. Is there a life outside of mobile these days? Or is this everything now mobile slash tablet? Is that where everybody should be focusing their efforts? Yeah, I just saw some article today. Some some exec from one of the dinosaur dying game companies made some miraculous announcement about how they're embracing mobile. And at this point, um, as, as if we're working in the game industry, if we're not, it's already too late. I mean. It's a no-brainer. Mobile first is so last year. Well, of course we're all on mobile. And there are a lot of reasons why we're on mobile, but I would say um, if you're not uh, focused on international markets, then you're missing the boat. Or if you're not looking at, at wearable technology or other areas in which gaming is taking place, then, then we're missing the boat. Mobile is a completely red ocean right now. I think it's a lot of smoke and mirrors. I think a lot of investors, especially angel investors, are going to lose their shirts in the next six months to a year. So mobile first is is like kind of 2013. So so uh, that's a really interesting point, though. Where are the big targets? Where are I the big targets? I thought it was. Or I know. <laughs> I just want to know though, where can people go? What was so so is so uh, congested? Where can people go? Well, what you want to do to what there are, I would agree with Margaret in that that mobile is definitely a red ocean that's crowded, and what which means that there it's a red ocean because there's a lot of competition, which means there are a lot of players, a lot of them are already in. What's cool about it though is it's very disruptive because you don't have to. Those players aren't coming from the, the, the big three publishers, which is what we had, you know, three years ago or five years ago. Uh, it's you know really really scattered, but the the, all, the additional challenge is that the price points have just gone down to free, and then you have to monetize, and that monetizing free to play does require quite a bit of uh, of market savvy and math, and you know some you know the Clash of Clans, Candy Crush, two games that are, have actually finally succeeded in monetizing. Uh, although I think we, our latest research says that they're going to have some issues in this coming year. Uh, you know you've got you, know, you have to have these mass PhDs in order to make free to play. Uh, really, really work for you in a lot of a lot of places. So you want to look at the. Can you look at the markets? Can you look at where gaming happened? Can you look at where gaming's not quite happening? New opportunities, new hardware. You know the all conferences going on now. The augmented world expo is happening right now. There's you know wearables like, like Margaret was saying. Uh, you can think about. There's always opportunity to disrupt a place that you know something that. And I think that's what's going to be the real big story. You know, at the coming round to the end of the year. I agree with that. Honestly, let's go on. It's free. Well, I don't really have a BS in that. Okay. Um, but I'll, I'll say uh, that. <laughs> I'll say that. So I, you can do it. You can do it with a BS in that, is what you're saying. I, I think that 
you know, you've got to hit them where they ain't. So while I do think there are many attractive platforms out there, like Tablet, for example, where the best-selling console of all time is 150 million units played at Station 2, Tablet sells outsell that annually, annually, almost 200 million tablets shipped last year. Um, there are many opportunities, but I also think on mobile, or any of these places that you're going, you always have to hit them where they ain't. I mean, definitely don't try to do a Clash of Clans clone on mobile, but don't try to do one on tablet either. Try to figure out what the blue ocean is and how to best exploit it. And if you can do that on mobile, it doesn't matter that there are you know a billion other apps out there on the App Store because everybody wants yours. But you have to be intellectually honest with yourself as to say, you know, like, why did they go to the App Store and get my app? And you have to have that as part of your strategy. Because if you don't have a strategy, you can't fail. You weren't trying to accomplish anything in the first place. And just to echo what Scott, not to exactly agree with him, but one thing that is important <laughs> is that, like my tell actually, yeah. <laughs> is that uh, mobile is the largest addressable platform, you know, for the foreseeable future. It's going to be, it is the largest, you know, it's going to be the largest addressable platform using a, you know, technology, you know, like Unity or another, you know, another thing that you can go across devices. So if you need an IP that's in games and you want to reach, you know, billions, potentially billions of people, uh, the mobile devices are going to be the smartphone, tablet, whatever it is, they're going to be, uh, you know, ubiquitous. They're the largest addressable platform. The challenge is that there's a lot of folks going for it. Yeah, I, I, would, I would maybe uh, just add that in the interest of being intellectually honest with yourself, mo I would imagine most of the people who are in here are small game developers who kind of got into the game industry because they're passionate about games and they feel like there's a kind of game that they really love and they want to make. Be intellectually honest with yourself about that. Don't go and make a Venn diagram of platform penetration and categories and say, that's what we need to make. If you don't give a shit about that kind of game and have no experience making that kind of game and are going to be doing it like it's a math problem. Like, make the game that you want to that, that you want to play and that you're going to love and make it for the platform that, that you want to play it on. Um, even if that platform is out of fashion or if that category is a little saturated um, or, or that category is out of fashion, I suspect it will be a much better game than something that you're making because you feel like it's the right, you know, business decision. I'm not saying like forget about the business concerns, but I don't know, I, I, I find it a little alarming when you meet people who are making games and, and it's clear that they never make they never play the game that they're working on. You know, your, your, heart, your heart won't be in it. It, it won't it won't be it won't be fun. If the team's not having fun, the yeah. game's not gonna be fun. And if you maybe want to, you know, maybe have an add to that, is like you could do the Van Diagram thing. It's like these are the games we like to play and make, and these are the games that have some market opportunity. You want to do, you know, the intersection of those of those two. Like, what are games we really like to make? What is something that could be disruptive or could be, you know, could get, you know, we could have some channel, get a channel, get out there. So I personally could go on with a whole list of questions. I, I'm conscious of time. And uh, I'd love to throw here, uh, open to the floor here, a couple of questions. I have a question. Okay. What are you playing right now, Dan? What about, well, I, we were talking about Warframe just yeah. a moment ago. I've been playing a bit of that. Yeah, so <laughs> we were talking about how Warframe's killing it. Yeah. And, you know, that's a... Yeah, I know, so out of fashion. It's like it a weird co-op, FPS, free-to-play on PlayStation. I mean, yeah. weird. You, you, you with, have a PC it, yeah, that's right. I play the, I play the, I play the, I play the PC game. But yeah, I mean, definitely not probably what you would pick if you were yeah. if you were doing this in some room at EA, you know, <laughs> some, some conference room. Yeah, and when Warframe was being shopped around, no one wanted to believe in them because they were like, oh, it's PC, it's co-op only. Who would ever want to play that? And well, look, the World of Tanks. I yeah, mean, I know. Everywhere you look at World of Tanks now, it's like, oh, yeah, of course. Where is World of Tanks? Uh, but, like, you yeah. imagine if someone described you, like, yeah, I want to make this incredibly fidgety tank battle <laughs> game, like, yeah, where is, yeah. where is actually World of Golf? Win, right? <laughs> World of Golf. Where is World of Golf? <laughs> World of Golf is a World of Golf working. That game was awesome. But it's not really, you know, like, World of Golf, right? Like, I 
want my world of wealth. So please, some um, aspiring entrepreneur, start Our teams that. are taking no. Yeah. I'm, world of golf. I'm going to you start a petition to yeah. bring Dan back <laughs> into the investments, and then we'll, we'll make it happen. So, all right. Uh, not get much help from the floor. They want help from Scott. <laughs> but uh, what would you like to say? So we're about to have some presentations. What would you like to see in them? What are, what are you looking for when you're when we're leading these pitch presentations? What are you particularly going to sort of focus in on? Passion. If I was making an investment, like I wouldn't invest in an entrepreneur who wasn't passionate about what they're doing. Anyone else want to throw out some? Disruption. So either a, uh, a new take on an existing platform or a you know existing genre and just you know a bit of a uh, bit of a twist. That's what I, I would look for any signs of risk. I would look at all the risk factors. Trade of risk or a anything team, product, vision. Just look for risk because the more risk that's on the table, the less attractive an investment opportunity. Anything, any last? Enter, entertainment property development. So um, gameplay can't be well legally protected, but sound story, symbols, characters, and themes can. And if you're thinking about that on the front end, if you're trying to build Star Wars along with building the, the next great gaming experience, that's much more attractive than something that I look at and say, you know, we can never make a movie out of it. Oh, wait, Mike. Yeah, so I've got a question. Um, Scott, uh, you're, you're obviously doing this right now and, and building a company. How, how did you go about kind of building the strategy for the company and the product? And, you know, and because of how crowded the space is and ensuring you've got something that, you know, is going to kind of have its own place and be somewhat unique. I mean, how did you guys go through that? So, uh, Patrick Mark, who uh, was the new Dan Fiden or an EIR over at uh, Signia Ventures after. Uh, I believe after Dan left, right? Yeah. Um, sweet office, by the way. Um, so, um, I had just uh, been part of the, the Big Head Mode sale to play first. I was looking around for something new, and I was miserable by the end of Big Head Mode because I've always cared about sound story symbols, characters, and themes. And at Big Head Mode, we gave, made games that turned like Facebook pictures into characters. So these games starred you and your friends, and we could make movies out of you and your friends, but we could never like build Star Wars out of that. And so he comes to me, this uh, uh, EIR from Sydney Adventures, and he says, "I want to make role-playing games, and I really care about intellectual property and you know entertainment property, it sounds simple stories, characters, and themes." And I was like, "I really care about." <laughs> entertainment <laughs> property, and I want to make an, an, an RPG, like this is Kismet, so it was just, you know, like just really uh, a confluence of desire, it's like we were both thinking the same things. Was that a satisfying, sat, uh, satisfactory? Oh. <laughs> because, so, so there's a ton of RPGs out, right? So like, so again, obviously you don't want to give away what you're, the specifics of what you're doing, but you know, how did you go about thinking about, you know, how you're creating kind of a space for yourself within a, you know, a very crowded job? So if you're willing to share. We played a lot of Eternity Warriors, and, uh, <laughs> which is my, one of Mike's many games. I didn't actually work great for that. I know. Um, and Mike is also the front man of an awesome 80s rock band, and this guy is just kind of awesome all the way around. I can totally so, see that. that yeah, please feel free to come up here with us. <laughs> okay. You definitely belong up here. Um, I, I can't give away what we're doing, but it, um, it's uh, unlike anything you've seen before, and yet people will love the brand for the whole of their lives. It's that good. So it's not just something that they'll love for a year. It's something that they're going to love and want to spend money on 20 years from now. That's the goal. I guess the part of it is just creating a strong idea itself. Yeah, cool. Are you asking like about the process, like how we did it? Yeah. How we came up with the idea. I mean, it started with essentially, what is the strategy? What market are we going to go after? Like, what do we what do we really believe is going to be relevant in the next three years? You know, do we think that I mean, if we're targeting tablets? We actually said that publicly, and it really was thinking there was, hey, everybody in our generation grew up with Nintendo as their default gaming platform. 
kids now are growing up with a tablet as their default gaming platform. You get an iPad, it's the first thing that you start to touch and play with. It's your introduction to games. You might go out you know, and bridge into the PC market if you want something more immersive. You might go to console, but everybody's going to have a tablet. So looking at what experiences are reasonable for that, and then it was really thinking, okay, we want to make really great intellectual property. Let's look at what's been popular for you know, the last 10 or 15 years. What are the brands, you know, where's the overlap on the gaming side that we feel like we can really develop an affinity to? And then I was like, do we like this or not? I mean, that's the thing. Like, when we sat down with Danielle, you know, we were like, RPGs. And she was like, I love RPGs. Yeah, it's like, Diablo 2 is my favorite game ever. So it's the only way, reason I would ever get back into the gaming industry. We, <laughs> we did have key insights like, uh, tablets are going to crush the consoles. People are going to grow up with the tablets. Uh, twice as much time on tablet is spent gaming versus the mobile phone. Um, the um, more money. Is yeah, spent. twice as much money. So twenty-eight dollars versus thirteen dollars on average. And then we have our own psychographic demographic research, which gave us like targeting information. So we did all of those cold, calculated, um, you know, exercises. But then our Venn diagram shaped like a heart, man. It's like <laughs> we we love RPGs. So. <laughs> That's great. I appreciate you sharing that. So uh, to uh, wrap up the panel there, um, though I'm sure that you are still around, there'll be time to mingle afterwards and if you want to follow up at some point. I want to thank our panelists for being here. I hope that we'll stay 